My name is Ann Chadovitz. I'm a copyright attorney advisor at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. I have uh, more than 20 years of experience uh, representing creators' interests. I've worked at ASCAP, I've worked for AFTRA, the Recording um, Singers Labor Union, and I've worked at the Future Music Coalition. Um, we are on Twitter, guys. Hashtag Musicians2025. Um, we're lucky to have a really good panel here. Um, and one's coming late and one's on Skype. So um, if they're, you're really lucky to get the leaders in the field of um, how, how the internet and the digital change is affecting musicians. So I'm going to ask them all to introduce themselves um, quickly, though because we are trying to save time for you all to have questions, too. So, Trish? Uh, my name is Patricia Pollock. I'm a labor lawyer here in Washington, D.C. Um, my firm has been general counsel to the American Federation of Musicians kind of since the dawn of time. So, <laughs> by accident, I've spent uh, much of my working life representing the American Federation of Musicians including helping to bargain their union contract that covers sound recording and film scoring, um, but also helping them with legislative efforts, the successful legislative effort to get the digital performance right, or as yet to be successful efforts to get a performance right that applies to radio, um, the setting up of sound exchange as a jointly organized and owned uh, entity to distribute digital royalties and serving on the sound exchange board in the Musicians Union seat for seven years. Kristen? Uh, my name is Kristen Thompson. I'm uh, with the Future Music Coalition and have been since it started in 2000. Um, Future Music Coalition is a national nonprofit that advocates broadly for musicians, um, but we, uh, since 2000, you know, sort of examined and tried to help musicians navigate this changing uh, landscape. And um, for the past year and a half, I've been working on a project called uh, Artist Revenue Screens, which we'll talk about today, basically a multi-method effort to better understand how musicians, how musicians' revenue streams are changing over time. Um, prior to Future Music Coalition, I ran an independent record label here in DC called Simple Machines and was in a band called Tsunami that was based in Arlington, Virginia. So that's what I do. And I'm still a musician, but just for fun. <laughs> and Dick? Great. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. I, just so you know, I can't hear Trish or Kristen very well. Oh, yeah. okay, because there's no mic there. They will, when they do their presentations, they'll be here, though. Okay, so I can hear you great. Okay, thanks. That's perfect. Um, great. So, hi, nice to meet everybody. I, I can't see any of you, <laughs> but I know you're there. I think you're there. Um, my name is Dick Huey. I've been in the music business for nearly 20 years. I've touched almost every part of the music business. I started out as a manager and signed a variety of um, different acts to the um, Beggars Group, which is a very, very large independent record label um, based in, in uh, London, England. Um, I started a job with Beggars in the mid-90s and served at their media department in 1997. The new media department was part of a record label that was dealing with digital media and um, what an MP3 was, and almost knew what an MP3 was back then. Um, I ran that for five years and then started my company Toolshed in 2001. Since then I've launched about 350 different um, individual artists promotional projects and have consulted a variety of different tech startups, including Spotify. And, and we all have to say the backdrop of all those CDs is just great right behind you. Um, anyhow, it's not a set, it's not a set. <laughs> each, uh, gonna, each of the artists is now, each of the, artists, each of the panelists is now going to give a presentation in 10 minutes about artists and technology. Well, so I'm uh, going to spend a few minutes talking about the internet and organized musicians. And by organized musicians, I don't mean musicians with neat closets. I mean musicians who are in labor organizations that, that bargain for them, um, most especially the American Federation of Musicians, although sometimes also singers in AFTRA, which is Stan's old organization. And um, since Anne asked me to talk a little bit about the good, the bad, and the ugly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the good, the bad, 
and um, not the ugly, but what I think of as the transformational things that are changing. Um, so to start with the bad, um, I, you know, I, it sounds a little um, like a Luddite to be saying there's anything bad about the internet in a panel that you're doing for the Internet Society. But certainly the internet has posed, uh, has posed um, some real uh, uh, challenges for musicians, and um, so I want to talk about them for just a couple minutes apiece. Um, certainly one of the first challenges that have, have uh, come to us from the internet is piracy of the unauthorized distribution of copyrighted material. And I, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the extent to which piracy has harmed the industry, whether it's totally, some, none, a little bit, whatever. I know that it's, uh, people have varying views about whether it is uh, uh, internet piracy that has caused the industry to struggle. But I will say that you know, the independent studies do generally all say that there has been an impact. And some say it's a near total impact, some say it's a minor impact, but they do say that there is an impact. And one thing that I can certainly say from years of working with musicians is that musicians see a real impact in their lives. Um, it is astonishing and sort of heart-rending to uh, individual musicians or musicians in groups to have the experience of um, fans telling them music is the most important thing in my life and that when they're asked do you ever buy any music they would say no. I mean, it, 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 I, I've heard that story from so many musicians and it's kind of crushing to their, to their <coughs> spirits uh, at, at least uh, in, in moments to see that transition of people who don't, they think music comes out of a spigot somehow and that they, they shouldn't have to pay for it. Um, and if, if any of you have not ever heard the song And I Copied It by Nancy White, it's a very kind of lighthearted uh, song about the experience of hearing from fans over and over again how much their, her music means to them. Um, and the way they expressed it was not by purchasing music, but by copying it and giving it to their friends. Um, I, another element uh, is, is the change in the market from physical sales and physical product market to uh, digital market and the internet market has had some pretty concrete results um, to quote the RIAA data, which I don't know, and can these words even come out of my mouth? <laughs> and I spent so many years together when she was at AFTRA and I was working for the AFM fighting tooth and nail with the RIA. <laughs> but um, it, it, it is true that physical units shipped have gone down drastically from uh, 1999 to 2009. It's a, a huge drop in that physical market, which was a lucrative market. So basically, that's a big loss of dollars. Um, and industry annual revenue has declined from uh, 14 and I think you're covering up to 14 and a half billion dollars, <laughs> um, down to 6.3 billion dollars in, uh, in 2009. So that's a huge loss. And the change of the market from a CD market, which was a very lucrative market, to a singles market where people don't make as much money per sale as, as they did um, with CD sales has got a, a very big effect. Um, and what that has led to in the organized industry uh, is contraction. Okay? And, what, and that has powerful and harsh effects on organized musicians. Um, so, for instance, wages and pension. That's kind of obvious to everybody what wages and pension are. Yeah. Musicians who work for organized recording companies, uh, and that is not just the majors, Universal, Sony, EMI, but also hundreds and hundreds of small and mid-sized recording companies who sign union agreements. Um, they earn a scale wage when they do a recording session and they get pension contributions so that they are earning a pension uh, when they do recording dates for covered employees, employers. Um, and the wages and pension combined have gone down drastically from 33.1 uh, 
um, million in, I guess it's 1999, down to 16.3 million in 2009, and it has dropped even more since then. So that's, those are, I mean, it, it's two lines on a bar chart, but it's people um, who are incredibly talented, and incredibly skilled, incredibly hardworking, who are out there scrambling, doing dates. They don't have you know nine to five jobs. They they get session dates, and they're really hurting because the work's not there. And it's not because the scale wages have gotten lower. It's because the dates aren't there. The work's not there. It's not being done, and people's incomes have gone down very drastically. Um, the same is true for the, the next set of bars. That's SPF stands for Special Payments Fund. If you uh, work for, uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you do a recording date that's a union covered recording date, you don't just get your scale wage and your pension contribution, you also get a share in something called the Special Payments Fund. And the Special Payments Fund is built up of money that is put in by signatory record companies. These record companies who have signed the union contract, they make contributions based on their sales, um, and that money goes into the special payments fund, and then it gets shared out every year, right about this time. Um, checks go out to musicians who have done recording dates under the union contract, and they share, and the, the, the sales revenue, and the value of the sales market, and you can see again from 1999 to 2009, that's been a very bad decline in SPF revenue, and that's very harmful again to the talented and hardworking musicians because the SPF checks are an important part of the, the sort of way that they put together making a living. And then the last chart, and did you right there with the music performance fund, <laughs> is, is a fund that people don't really know very much about. It was created by the American Federation of Musicians in the recording industry decades ago, actually, and it's a, a piece of uh, the recording sales uh, revenue goes into the music performance fund, and then that money is used to pay for live performances of music that are free to the public. And those happen all across the country um, and also in Canada. And they this uh, have they've been an important way of getting work for musicians, you know, live performing work for musicians, but also exposing. Uh, young people, communities to live music, which is you know harder and harder to do. So that fund's been kind of a vital and important fund in communities, but it is tied to the sale uh, revenue from physical product sales, not from digital sales. And that fund, as you can see, has dropped down very, very drastically. So um, the contracting industry, you know, when you think of it as Universal, or you think of it as EMI or Sony, it's hard to get all worked up about the notion of a contracting industry, a contracting smaller than industry. But when you think about it from the point of view of working musicians um, and communities, it gets to be, you know, get you more and got that a contracting industry is, is bad for our uh, bad for music. Um, well, it's not all bad, of course, and I, I won't linger here about good things, especially because I think Kristen is um, probably going to talk a little bit, or maybe even a lot, about um, a lot of the new ways that musicians uh, can, can get an income from, um, from digital. There's lots and lots of new income streams that can, different kinds of income streams from all the different kinds of digital exploitation. Um, uh, and the union agreements, uh, have found ways to share in those new forms of income. So, so you have digital downloads, non-interactive streaming of various types, interactive streaming, um, and the digital revenue. Now the RIAA is saying that this is the first year that 50% of their income and revenue has been from digital exploitation and not fiscal product sales. Now that. That's not enough, obviously, to make up the difference of the lost physical product sales, but it's, you know, it, that it is a place of great growth and great variety. Um, so the union contracts have evolved in order to deal with that. Uh, you know, now the union contracts require the sharing of revenue, not just from physical product sale, but also from downloads, um, and also from uh, music videos, which is a market that didn't really exist before at all. In the past, the musicians made music videos. It was strictly considered a promotional thing, 
and the session musicians who worked on those music videos didn't really get anything, hardly anybody made any money from them. Now there's a thriving market for streaming of music videos and uh, session musicians share in that under the collective bargaining agreements and uh, people can now make money out of that. And another thing that's happened um, in the world of organized musicians is that the, the formulas for sharing in sales revenue in the digital market are very different from the old formulas uh, for sharing in the sales revenue from physical product. The union formulas for physical product look a lot like stinky recording contract royalty provisions. They're packaging allowances, thresholds, um, breakage allowances, you name it, all those kind of things are built into the union agreements as well um, as in the traditional royalty agreements. But when it comes to digital, digital revenues, the formulas are much simpler and better, and we get a better bite uh, out of the digital revenues uh, than, than we ever got out of the, the physical uh, product revenues. Um, and we also, not under the traditional collective bargaining agreement, but under other agreements that the unions have with the recording companies, we get a share of interactive streaming, so things like Rhapsody um, or any of the other sort of on-demand interactive streaming services. Uh, not only pay artists in the way that Kristen will probably talk to you about, but also a share that goes to a union fund for distribution to the background musicians and background vocalists on those recordings. Um, the other, um, you know, incredibly good development from, I guess you wouldn't say strictly speaking the internet, but from the, the digital world is the whole new area in U.S. law of the, you know, the drive for performance right and the first successful drive for performance right was the creation of the digital performance right in sound recordings. And when that right is collectively administered through sound exchange, it has incredible benefits for performers. Um, it's the first time, the first place where you have a substantial amount of money that is set aside by law for performers. So 45% by law has to be allocated to the royalty or featured artist, um, and 5% for the session performers on uh, recording. And that money by agreement with the unions cannot be recouped. It's not part of the artist's contract. Um, it's not part of the royalty deal. It's just money that goes to musicians. And that's just an incredibly fabulous thing. And it's, it's there, really, as, as Ann knows, because the unions um, fought for that when the act was uh, um, being worked through the legislative process in the early 90s. Um, and later, the provisions about direct payments to artists also came into the law. So it's uh, a, a sort of a guaranteed stream for performers. Um, and so, you know, in, in lieu of the ugly, I, I wanted to talk about the transformational, one of the things um, for, from a labor lawyer um, and union point of view is that um, working through the issues that have, um, that we've faced because of the internet and because of the new forms of digital exploitation has really caused us to rework in very significant ways uh, the elements of the collective bargaining deals and the other relationships with the record companies in ways that are beneficial to musicians and hopefully we'll continue to be able to do that. And it has, I mean, I think people don't really quite realize that unions don't only bargain contracts, they also engage in other activities. Um, and certainly the American Federation of Musicians and AFTRA have always engaged in legislative and policy work. But dealing with the internet and um, all the issues that came to us from the new forms of digital exploitation have really focused union efforts and the efforts of um, musicians and artists in, uh, at large, I think, on um, whole new world other than collective bargaining and contracts, the legislative efforts, the um, ability to power, the desire to get more and more sharing in the markets um, set aside by legislation and in ways that can be administered collectively through entities like Sound Exchange um, so that our musicians all can get their share in a clear, transparent, and fair way. Um, so I think that's really Kind of, I've got my slides, but the substance is all kind of there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, Trish. <laughs> um, I'm going to follow the end. It's great that Trish went first because there's a lot.
lot of stuff that I think um, commissioners really know and what I'm about to talk about, which is pretty much based on the arts revenue stream work that I've been working on with my co-director, Jane Cook, at the Future Music Publishing Group for about 18 months now. Um, for us, we are really cognizant of this drastic change in the music landscape, especially in the past 12 years. There's been so many technologies that have developed and services that have helped musicians overcome a lot of barriers and hurdles that made it really difficult to participate in the marketplace prior to that. Um, so, you know, it's clear that there's a bunch of new services available, but for Future Music Coalition, the next logical question is how are musicians' revenue stream changing? How are they ability to make a living based on their, on their work? So that's the question we've been examining it for the past year and a half. And um, the project is called Arts Revenue Stream. It's a multi-method, cross-genre examination of musicians' revenue streams and how they're changing over time. It's, um, there's obviously lots of metrics out there right now that we could look at to try and examine and gauge how the music industry is changing, you know, from Nielsen ratings to SoundScan and market share, all those things are really interesting and helpful in us understanding how things are changing, but it's only when you ask musicians directly about their individual earning capacity and how it's changing over time that I think we get a better sense of what it's like, what, how much money they're putting in their pocket. And how we did it was through, we did three things at once. We did in-person interviews uh, with about 80 different musicians. And for anybody who cares about social research, we did um, a snowball sample. So we found individuals and then asked them for peer referrals and then moved through a bunch of different um, cycles to, to find our interviewees. We also did some financial case studies. And I have a couple of slides from those, but they're also available online, which were basically financial audits where we had five to ten years of actual financial data, all of it, including income and expenses from about from five different musicians. And then we did a widely distributed online survey, which um, was entered by a lot of musicians. In fact, over 5,300 US-based musicians, performers, and composers completed last, month, last year's survey, um, which was a really wonderful response rate. Uh, of the, I'll just talk a bit about the survey population. Um, 40% of the survey respondents spent more than 36 hours a week doing their craft, which we consider basically a full-time job. Um, of them, 42% earn all of their money, personal income, from their craft, from music. Although certainly there's a, a range. Um, the average personal gross income was $55,000, but that could also include another job or investment income, whatever. But because we knew how much time they spent doing music and how much of their money was derived from music, we were able to calculate. <laughs> That's at five there. Um, the, uh, an average, what we're calling our average estimated music income, how much of their money was derived just from music, and that was about $34,000, which is kind of the same as the US median income for a person right now. Um, the, there's lots of genres represented, and we asked people to give us their first, second, and third pri primary genres. Classical was the most likely genre, uh, followed by jazz, rock, alt rock, and then a bunch of other ones that were, you know, well represented. Uh, and then there was 500 and some different <laughs> open-ended answers to the <laughs> genres. Uh, to the specific points about um, the questions we have today about how the internet is impacting musicians, um, I'm going to focus on just some of the findings based on the data we collected. Clearly, we have a lot of different ways we can look at this, but for today, I wanted to sort of talk about three things. First is that um, emerging technologies have had a significant impact on musicians' careers. Now, we should think really broadly because when we ask people in the interview stage, you know, what is the most, you know, what are some technologies or services that you think have been, um, you know, helpful or, you know, helped you? help you, and then what, which ones have been disruptive. And so their answers to that were really wide-ranging. So we'll see from some quotes I have from some of the interviewees. Um, some people talked about how it's leveled the playing field in the most obvious way. Um, that technology has knocked down a lot of barriers that used to be really, the bottlenecks that used to make it very difficult for people to participate in the music marketplace unless they were signed to a big label. So a jazz manager told us that was something he thought was the most important, one of the biggest impacts. Another one said was more about how it's um, empowered him to be more self-sufficient. Um, uh, the 
this person now books their own tours and sort of has reduced the overhead costs because he's not running to the post office every day mailing promo kits. Um, on our survey, we also asked people about how comfortable they're using internet-based technologies. And there was a, a, we sort of gave them a very basic top level list. But it was interesting that um, promoting their music and connecting with fans, there's a healthy percentage that feel okay with that. Um, I think it might be covered up by Dick, but the distribute and selling your music was the one that had the least comfort level at 31%. But, you know, it is a difficult thing to learn and to navigate properly, which is why Future Music Coalition tries to do things like those handouts to try and help people understand how it works. Um, we also asked them about what tools they're using, um, and we asked them in two different buckets. First, we asked them, hey, if you're a musician or composer, what kind of tools are you using in the studio or to create your work? And this was just the top five. But if people aren't familiar with, with these, um, they're fairly common tools um, for studio work, although Finale is one for composing, so that's usually for composing. Um, when we asked people about, specifically, and when we asked the interviewees about helpful technologies, people got very specific about uh, different software packages available that make it possible for them to compose and produce something in the studio that's ready for radio. That the song, singer songwriter really felt that that was helpful for him. Um, we also asked them about tools and services they might be using to, to promote or distribute or sell their music. And Facebook was the like, most likely response, followed by an artist's website and blog. Then YouTube, MySpace, CD Baby, Twitter, and so on. But you know, these are really quite common in the music community. These, these are well used by lots of different artists. And so I wasn't surprised to see the list like this. Um, then, you know, again, another answer, a very different answer from somebody about helpful technology. Somebody said Facebook was, had really been helpful. It given them the possibility to get connected to other musicians, other creators. They've got lots of shows through it. Um, we asked them a bit uh, more, a question about how the internet has affected their musical career in a, in a broad sense as well. And we made sure that when we asked this question that we balanced a positive statement with equal number of positive statements with negative ones. And it's funny that the answers kind of reflect that too, which was really ties in nicely with what Trish was saying. There's, you know, good and bad sides to everything. You know, people are excited that they can communicate with their fans directly and that they can manage their careers themselves, but it's more competitive than ever. And their day-to-day -day work is more about promotion than creation. You know, there's these, these, these trade-offs that we're seeing that were really reflected not only in the survey, but also in the interviews. Um, this was a film and TV composer, and it was kind of long-winded, but I'll start it to say, like, he used to get paid a certain amount to compose a piece for film and TV, and now the clients that he approaches will have, you know, a fraction of that amount, and he's like, I'm not going to do it for that, but some 20-year-old kid will. So he's saying that the price for his work, the, there's, there's, the floor keeps falling down. Um, so what about revenue? So with our artist revenue streams work, we did actually ask questions about how much money people are making through various revenue streams. And we had a list of 42 that was our framework for our work. And um, in fact, it's on our website um, for money.futuremusic.org. You can see all 42. But, here, I'll give you a, just a couple of slides. So, it, interestingly, there were a lot of different revenue streams that we asked about, but just to focus on one set. 6% of, we aggregate all the income from all 5,300 people that responded to the survey. Only 6% of their income in the last four months came from selling sound recordings or licensing sound recordings.
direction of change. We didn't ask them about how much has changed sort of in dollar figures, but it's increasing. Now, it's probably not replacing the money they used to make on CD sales if they sold them, but it's moving in, a, in a, that direction. Back to our interviews, we've had people say that iTunes has been specifically helpful, uh, mostly because it's the, it's the most prominent digital retailer in the country. Um, in comfort of interactive streaming services, this is Spotify and Rhapsody and Ardio. We asked the same question, have you ever earned any money from on-demand streaming? Not as many, 35% have said, at some point, yes I have. And we asked those yes people, is it going in the right direction? 50% say yes, it's increasing over time. Again, we don't know the magnitude of the change, we only know the direction. And again, income from digital, from online streams is usually very, very tiny right now. Um, a, a touring rock band manager said, yeah, you know, this income from online streams is still tiny, but it keeps getting better every quarter. How about non-interactive streaming services? That's the sound exchange money that comes from webcasts. Uh, Pandora, Sirius XM. Um, a hard rock band, this was, I thought, really fascinating. They, um, there's a lot of hard, there's a, some hard rock stations on Sirius XM that focus on metal and hard rock, and they've really been embraced by those stations and definitely saw it in their sound exchange checks. They said sound and radio has really been a revenue stream for them. Um, a jazz publisher said that sound exchange money has become a real source of income. Okay. which is really interesting to see, especially in jazz, because, again, it's a, it's a genre that doesn't get a lot of airplay, so it's nice to see uh, people talking about sound exchange's impact. So, back to this, you know, this question on the, inter on the survey, you know, have you ever been, um, have you ever received any money for digital performances from sound exchange? Only a small percentage have, but of those people, oh, it's going in the right direction. Um, um, when Ryan Kellen gets here, I'm sure he can talk about Sound Exchange's um, efforts to try and get more and more musicians to sign up for Sound Exchange. It's an op it's a service where they collect royalties for everybody, but until people come to sign up, even though it's free, the royalties just sit there. So you can get that on your list. Yes, and there, as of two days ago, Sound Exchange has published a list with over 15,000 artists on it, trying to encourage people to check the list for their own names to make sure that there's not money waiting for them. Um, and if there is money, please come to Sound Exchange and basically, you know, tell them that it's your, you are the person they, they owe it to. Oops, my takeaways are all scrambled. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that our emerging technologies in general had an impact on musicians, and I say it, impact with being pro and con. There's both parts of the equation are important to recognize that digital, money from digital sales is um, it seems to be going the right direction, and that revenue from streams is very small, a very small sliver of musicians' revenue streams right now, but it's it's increasing over time. And uh, you know, Future Music Coalition has more about this work. We have financial case studies that show income and expenses over time of some people. This is an absolute my favorite slide of the whole study. <laughs> Jazz Simon, number Simon needs my group. And um, we've done other data releases, and you can find us on our website at money.futuremusic.org. Thanks. Okay, Dick, so it's your turn now. Okay. You okay. You're on. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So I'm sitting here staring at a clock. <laughs> That's what's up in my world. It's this is huge, giant clock, so I know I'm not going to go over oh. I was going to run a little stopwatch, but I guess I won't eat it. Um, okay, I thought I'm going to take a little bit different path than, than both Kristen and Trish took. I'm going to talk a little bit about, just a little bit about my experience when I was a starting manager. That's much better, <laughs> much more interesting now. I can actually see it's there. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about um, my experience as a starting manager and what was possible back in the late 80s, early 90s, when I was managing a few different rock bands, small ones, uh, that I never really ended up making a whole lot of money. But they did get signed to you know, uh, uh, some nice record labels. Uh, 
the so back in those days, it was all about uh, it was all about touring. It's still all all, all about touring. Uh, touring is a, it's a primary income stream for uh, for artists. And back then, um, you know, I spent a lot of time booking my own artists. Uh, I come around clubs. I get them out to shows. I drive them around in many cases. And um, you know, I bought the musician's bible. Uh, which is this little book that uh, when I would arrive in a town, it would tell me where all the local record stores were. I'd go to those record stores and I'd make sure that we, uh, you know, or I'd try, try to do consignment sales of, of our CDs um, if possible. I would. Can everybody hear me still? Yeah. No? yeah. Okay, good. I'd try to do, um, you know, we'd, we'd sleep out on balconies. All that kind of stuff, and it was, um, you know, the, the biggest challenge was I didn't really have a way to get to feel like I was doing anything other than playing locally, because there were gatekeepers that controlled all of the all the big outlets. You know, there was there was no internet, there was no way for me to spread my music around. I couldn't give it away if I wanted to. I mean, I. Could, Share CDs and I could give people CDs and shows, but that was really the that was really the extent of it. So I guess I would call that time period maybe BC. Okay, that, that was the BC period. So now we'll move into the AD period, which is the the, the, the uh, after democratization or um, uh, you know after the end of the internet, and things changed massively. I was no longer a manager at that point. But the options that were available to me, had I been a manager at that point, were really completely different. Starting with, um, now both Kristen and Trish have talked some very important areas. Um, probably the most important thing I think that's happened, you know, in maybe the last 12 or 13 years, is the, the democratization of distribution. Distribution for a, for a beginning artist used to be what I was saying before, uh, going to a local record store and seeing if they would take assignments of CDs, or uh, actually tapes first and then CDs, um, or seven inches even. That's actually changed substantially today. <coughs> Artists still have access to label relationships for distribution, but they also have and they also have access to direct relationships. It's been a huge game changer for artists. Um, companies like TuneCore, for instance, uh, which allow uh, which allow the just to, you know they allow you to upload your own music and distribute it to a wide variety of uh, different outlets for a flat fee, flat yearly fee. Um, they've, been, they've been good, good game changers. Um, they've also presented surprises for musicians because, you know, just being in a store, just being in a Walmart, doesn't mean you're actually going to sell anything. As soon as you're in a Walmart, you start to realize that the people who are selling all the all the things are the people who are in the front of the Walmart, the people who have the nice space, shelf space, and everything else. And companies like mine, promotion companies like mine help artists to get that kind of shelf space, but not everybody is going to work with a company like mine. So um, one of the things that's been I think, particularly amazing for artists has been the advent of um, social networking. And that's really where we're focusing so heavily today. We're focusing on social networking and tying together social networking. So that's social networking, um, or let me say that differently. We're focusing on tying social net networking very directly into an artist's presence. And I'm going to give a couple very specific examples. Um, we have an artist that we're working with right now uh, named MNDR. She's, um, she's on Ultra Records. And uh, she's, her de de debut album just came out yesterday. So um, I can tell you that this artist spends upwards of three hours a day 
doing some form of social networking. That would be that would be Twitter, or it could be Instagram, it could be Facebook, it could be sound tracking, which is a little application that um, allows you to share uh, songs that pop in your head. Um, and um, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, she she's from that generation of artists for whom this feels natural. Um, burdensome, but natural. And the end result is she's been able to, in, in the four months that we've worked with her, she's been able to build her Facebook from very little, 400 followers, up to about 7,000 followers. Um, she's just about doubled her Twitter. Um, and what this means for everybody, uh, for, for, what this means for her in, in particular, She's been able to um, create a group of people around her that believe in who she is because she talks to them directly. They believe in who she is, they believe in what she stands for. And it, it's um, created a scenario where she can ask them to do things and they'll respond. Um, one of the things about social networking that, um, that we do when we, or I should say, one of the things that we do when we uh, start a campaign with a new artist is we look at how they're talking to people utilizing their social media profiles. We look to see whether they're um, whether they're dating or whether they're um, <laughs> uh, not dating and <laughs> just got to do one thing. So uh, I would say maybe 95% of the artists that we work with make the mistake of only posting about what they're trying to sell. They aren't actually trying to create a relationship. And we spend uh, a large part of time with, with almost every campaign we're part of teaching artists to, uh, to have a conversation with the same way you have a conversation with a friend. Um, that's, uh, that's been very, very effective for us. And I thought I, I think I might be uh, winding down my time here. So I wanted to give you an example of uh, a live example that we came up with today for uh, a client that we're about to start working with. I won't mention who it is since it doesn't run yet, but maybe you'll recognize it if you see it out there. Um, <clears throat> so we had a, uh, and, and, and I, wanted, I wanted to want you to understand how the social media component of what we're doing here obviously wouldn't have even been possible before 2006 and how it completely changes the landscape for what this artist is able to do with a particular video that they're about to release. Now, back in the old days, releasing that video meant that you um, did your best to reach out to some bloggers, to get some blogs to um, promote it, um, or even before that time, you sent it to MCV, chances were one in a million that they would actually do something with it. So, um, instead, today, um, we're coming up with ideas that are, that are similar to this one. So, we, we have a video, we have a video, and we're, um, we're asked to uh, develop a campaign around it. Here's an example of, of a kind of campaign that, that would not have been possible, um, really, even two or three years ago. <clears throat> Tracks can be released digitally, uh, and probably it's a 12-inch, uh, it's a single. It's coming out in October. We'll be involved for about two months. Um, we're going to choose a group of winners, and um, the way we're going to uh, uh, encourage people to participate in this is we're going to utilize a wide variety of different social media platforms, and we're going to randomly pick a winner from each platform, and uh, we were going to have uh, these uh, will probably be nine winners doing a Google Hangout with our artist, um, where that artist is going to sit and play some songs that were name checked in this particular video. So that's the, that's the finding. And here's how you here's how you actually do it. You uh, would create a um, first of all we're going to uh, be focusing this over Twitter. Um, so uh, the red label ball will start sending out tweets every 24 hours or so, take it on 
message um, and utilizing hashtags. Hashtags are, um, how do I explain a hashtag? Mm -hmm. Hashtag is a, a, a way of subclassifying a particular tweet. For instance, I could say, I could create a hashtag and say, um, uh, you know, hashtag, is the greatest. <laughs> and anybody else that wanted to search for hashtag, think you the greatest, would find um, my tweet, and they could do their own tweet and say, no, he's not that great. <laughs> hashtag, think you the greatest. <laughs> so you get a conversation going, sort of a mini conversation within the broad conversation worldwide that is Twitter. So we have these conversations that um, we expect, we have this label that we expect to be putting out a message, and we are then going to be driving people from this message to a wide variety of different platforms. Instagram is one of them. We will have artists take, uh, excuse me, we'll have participants take pictures of record albums and upload them to their Instagram account along with the hashtags that we're using. That will allow us to see who participated. Uh, on YouTube, we're going to post a video. We're going to uh, encourage comments, and we're going to tie those comments directly to the video using video commenting, which is part of YouTube. We're going to uh, tie in several different digital retail platforms by creating playlists of songs that were part of the um, you have to see the video to understand it. Essentially, they were name checked in the video. <laughs> With many of the big retailers, iTunes, REO, and Spotify. And then we'll try to get them to, uh, each of those companies to promote the event. Um, and uh, this goes on and on and on. And uh, at the end of it, we'll go through each platform, we'll pick a winner, and we'll have this fun little hangout. So that gives a pretty good idea of, of what we do. Um, of where we're focused, of why I am so excited about um, the potential um, for internet promotion that wasn't even in the game when I was a manager. And um, I'd love to hear your questions uh, if there are any. You can turn my mic back on them. And I'll ask the panelists to So, um, well, that's what I said. I was going to, I had a whole list of questions I was going to ask the panel, but seeing as it's about the internet, which is a you know, democratizing tool, I'm not going to ask any of my own questions. And I'll go right to you, and we also have some on Twitter, right? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I have my music on CD Baby, and I guess you know, it's distributed through a number of channels, um, I guess similar to TuneCore. And then I signed up with Power Stage and um, well, Django and some other ones, and I've noticed that some of these, I mean, CD Baby, I understand you have to pay, you know, to have your music uploaded, and then they create the website, and et cetera, and the barcode. However, I've noticed, and I signed up with Music X Ray also, but I've noticed that some of these opportunities, and also in Reverb Nation and um, these other sites, they ask for money for the competitions or the contests, and I'm just wondering, I'm not made of money yet, maybe someday, but I'm just curious whether, you know, it's worth doing. Some of them are $3, some of them are $10, some of them are $20, et cetera. So, you know, a person could go broke just entering these competitions. I'm wondering, you know, how valid are these and are they worth investing in or not? Good question. Dick, that seems like your category. I'm happy to take this question. I'm super happy to take this. <laughs> I can't see who asked it, but thanks, thanks for asking the question. Sure. Right here. Um, so, in my opinion, there have been a wide variety of articles written about, uh, uh, about a thousand true fans. Uh, many of you may have heard something about this. If you Google a thousand true fans, you're going to find a whole series of articles that I think will be interesting for you to read about. I'm going to make a blanket statement that might come back to haunt me, but I think it's a waste of money to pay for, uh, to, 
to pay for services that critique your that critique your music or critique you or promise to connect you to one person or another um, and, and do this for hundreds or thousands of artists. I think you would be much better served spending your time and whatever money you have, you know, for folk art. It'd be, better, it'd be better for you to take five hours a week uh, to work five hours less a week if you're in a position to do something like that and spend that five hours trying to uh, build up an audience, trying to uh, uh, develop a, uh, you know, a, a circle that's familiar with your music and that's interested in your music. Um, you know, I'm going to say one other thing about this and then I'll let you guys talk. Um, I think it's really important to treat the process of uh, doing your social networking or, or the creation of products, creation of digital project, products, uh, you know, the, uh, you know and, and an idea for a promotion that you might have, or if you decide to try to raise funds through Kickstarter or another outlet, uh, you know, for a record that you haven't yet recorded. It's so important to treat that with the same level of importance that you treat the actual creation of your music and your artwork for, for your director. And I'm going to say again that probably 95% of bands that try to do this um, put all their time and energy into their music and probably have a lot of time and energy into what their record cover looks like. And then they stop. I would personally spend a lot more time focusing on creating a, a, a core group of people around you that believe in what you're doing. Thanks. That's all I have to say. Um, I'll go to a tweet and then to you. Okay, let me bring this back over here. Um, got, a, got a few questions. Let's see Pick here. Pick one. Pick one. <laughs> um, what is uh, American Federation of Music or Future Music? Music Coalition's view on differential treatment of digital royalties between terrestrial and online radio. Mm -hmm. well, that's well, and have we the okay. Um, the question was, what does the AFM and what does FMC think about the differential treatment of radio, um, terrestrial radio versus digital radio? And for background, that the question is. Digital radio pays the digital performance right, which both Trish and Kristen talked about. Terrestrial radio doesn't. Um, in the US, the rest of the world does, but in the US, we don't, which is horrible. And I'll let you <laughs> <laughs> for the use of their music on, on the radio. I mean, it's an entire business that is built up out of the use of recorded music, and the thought that they don't have to pay musicians is nuts. <laughs> and, as Ann said, is different from anywhere else in the you know, organized economic world. Um, and it's also crazy that the new digital services should have, that, uh, that they have, have to pay and terrestrial radio not have to pay. You know, it's a, un, an uneven platform. And the way to make it even is to bring radio up and not, not to drop everybody down. Right. I mean, at Future Music Coalition is very similar to AFM. We, I would say the same thing as Chris, so I'm not going to repeat myself. <laughs> and Dick, are you there? Yes, but I can't really hear the question, so you have to repeat it. Okay. And I, um, it was the question about the, um, what, what do you think about uh, terrestrial radio not having to pay where digital online does have to pay? Talking about broadcast performance right? Yeah, are you asking me that question? I think it's, I think it's ludicrous. Okay, see, we're all in agreement here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm fully, fully supportive of, I think, everybody on the panel. It's, it, it makes no sense. It's, I think there are three countries worldwide where there's no terrestrial performance right. Uh, I'm probably going to get the other two wrong. One of them is the U.S. China, maybe? 
as Iran? They're trying to have some performance rate. I, 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 I told you I probably would get it wrong, but they're really, they're really literally are about three countries worldwide that do not have performance right now. Unfortunately, the country that has the largest music presence in the world is one of them. Right. I'll quote Casey, who's sitting in the front here the axis of exploitation. Casey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have two questions. One very general. Who are you? Uh, I'm Jeff Alexander with um, SRI. Um, but Kristen is very narrow about your study and then one that's broad for everyone. A narrow question is, um, how do you feel if your sample is representative of the population of musicians, or is it, it seems kind of narrow. But the bigger question is, that the topic here is Musicians 2025. We've heard a lot of great stuff about what's happened in the last five years. I'm curious because from an economic point of view, digital distribution lowers barriers to entry, which means that Basically, profit goes away, and we would expect compensation to drop for everyone until it basically becomes worthless to start to be a musician at all. So I'm kind of curious. Looking ten years or twelve years ahead, do you see you know, why would somebody actually want to get into the music business given that potential future? Well, okay. So to answer your short question, uh, it's very difficult to do a representative sample of musicians because we don't know. There is no governing body and no certification to, to know what the size of the population is even in general so it's very hard to get a representative sample so we don't say that that's the case but it is the reason that knowing that going into it was the reason why we did three methods at once we thought doing just a survey wouldn't be sufficient doing just interviews wouldn't be sufficient so that's why we did all three and so they kind of they, they inform each other um, but really one of the best things we could do is replicate it you know, it's, we have a kind of a weak proxy to understand how things are changing over time because we ask the survey respondents and the interviewees, well, how is it changing, right? But this is their memory, and oh, five years ago I was making more or less, and we'd have to do it again to really do a better measurement of the change. Um, and then the changing going forward, I'll start with that, and I'm sure other people have an idea, is that I do think that, you know, sort of those things <laughs> up there probably will dictate what musicians are paid in the future, that the economics of, of supply and demand, there's way more supply. There, there's, there's so many musicians now, and it's very competitive because the, the barriers to entry to the marketplace are very low now. Um, and the, some of the things that we're selling, some of our product is very low priced. You know, streams are fractions of a penny. So the things that I'm speaking in most, my most economic voice possible, is that the things that remain the exclusive part of musicians, live performance, the fact that my show tomorrow will be different than the show on Saturday in New York, is something I think a lot of musicians are going to really rely on. But that means more and more musicians are going to go out on tour trying to, because live revenue money is going to be so much more important and so, so much more critical. I'm not sure what it's going to look like. I'm not sure that we'll have a rising tide lifting many boats, or if, you know, the, the, there'll just be such a huge dispersion amongst all the revenue streams and the, the many musicians that people will be making less. I just don't know. Um, but, you know, we hope that Artist Revenue Streams project serves as a benchmark, as a, a starting point, so we can sort of measure against something in the future. Trish, did you have something else to add? I don't think I have anything sensible I can say about that. You know, for, for, you know, for, you know the organized musicians are always, you know, and since forever have been faced with competition from musicians who are always willing to work for less. And at some point, I think we all have to stand up and say, no, there really is a standard. We can't sell for less than X. We can't perform for less than Y. Um, it, 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 you know, d democracy is great and more accessibility is, is great, but, but we have to be able to say, well, we are worth something. In fact, what we are worth is X. You know, in, in, in the prehistoric times, I mean, not just BC, today, but in the <laughs> prehistoric times, the professional musicians refused to work for less than X. And, they, and they, in their communities, they set a scale, and you, you could not get a musician who was worth anything to work for less than that scale. And you know, it wasn't it wasn't organizing contracts. It was scale. It was standard setting. Was how professional musicians kept the standard up. Well, you know, we don't have that anywhere now. And to some extent, we have to replicate that in some new ways. Okay, I'll take a tweet and then a person again alternating. 
Okay, there's a couple of these that go together, so I'll just read them both. Um, I think uh, this question is directed to uh, Dick Huey, and he described that artists need to engage with fans outside of traditional promotion. The question is the time requirements of social media detract from the time for music, and how do you balance that? And as a follow-up on that is um, how much is social media becoming something that musicians should outsource to management labels or other professionals like Dick? That's okay, I'm going to okay, ask Dick. I caught the second part of that. I, I didn't catch the first part. Okay, I'll tell you. And then actually afterwards I'm going to ask Kristen to talk about it too because I think it came up some yeah. in, in some of the answers. So Dick, the first question was um, how do you see the, or how do musicians see the need to engage in social networking taking away or taking away from their time, their ability to create and the time spent to creating. Um, and you heard the second part. Yep. So, okay. So, so I, I, I can answer that question very easily. Um, doing social networking takes away from your time to create, hands down. It's, there, there, there's no question about it that if you, if you maintain kind of presence that I'm talking about that is going to impact your, well, let me put it differently. It's going to impact your time. Um, what, I, what I would suggest, I mean, how do I put this? It, it impacts my time. The time I spend social networking during the day means I'm not doing something else. I try to make something else that I'm not doing not stuff that I can't live without. So if I'm taking whatever it is, three hours a day doing social networking, it's kind of a bad example for me because it's my career. But, but I, I mean, I also, I, I'm a musician. I'm a, a half amateur musician, but I'm a musician. And you know, I, I still like to play and practice and sing. And you know, I would argue that I have to suck away from some other three hours of my day. You know, whether that's the, you know, hour that I take a nap in the afternoon. I'm not saying I do that. <laughs> the hour that I take a nap in the afternoon, or the, you know, the half an hour that I have a drink after yeah, work, or, you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, that this is what's happening right now to this artist, Emma Dierra, that I mentioned. Um, you know, it, there's no question it impacts her time. Um, and it's very, it's very complicated to fit it in. But if you don't fit it in, then you're essentially ceding the territory of your own destiny to the gatekeepers in the industry. You're saying to publicists and to bloggers and to other people who you're maybe not directly connected to, I really hope you're going to like my music and talk about it. And if they don't, you don't have something to fall back on. So I think it's important. And that's going to answer the second part of your question, too, which is, should you outsource this? I think that, depending on what kind of an artist you are, you might be able to outsource some of what you do. But I would really strongly advise against removing yourself entirely from the product test. I think that at the end of it, and I'll give you a specific example. We work with an artist called Martin Sexton. So, Martin Sexton, we worked for, for years to convince that he should do a post of his own on his own Facebook. And, you know, we were doing posts and getting 20, maybe 25 responses that were clearly not coming from him. When he put up a very simple post about uh, sitting down and teaching his son how to play guitar, it had 30 shares. 140 likes, you know, 85 comments, and that pretty much says it all. Well, just just really briefly, yeah, we did ask on the survey, but it also came up in interviews that we tried to ask people about the work balance, and a lot of artists and some of the managers talked about being exhausted trying to juggle it all, and um, some managers. Uh, also, especially in some of the jazz and classical people we talked to, making calculated decisions about what they were going to spend their time and resources, limited resources on, and some of it had to do with um, 
recognizing what their bread and butter is and really making sure they take care of that, whether it's being in touch with presenters or making sure their artist is, you know, ready to tour Europe and go to the festivals. It, it was very specific to the artist, but this was oftentimes social networking was seen as an, uh, something else that they have to take on and they were all trying to figure out how to fit it in, so. Yeah. I'm Mike Nelson. Uh, among other things, I'm a professor of Internet Studies at Georgetown, and I'm a bit of a futurist, so I'm very glad that you're willing to take on these questions. Um, just a couple of observations. It seems to me one conclusion I would draw is that we're only going to have extroverted musicians in the future. <laughs> <laughs> the second observation is... Now the other ones will be in the symphonic orchestra. <laughs> Second observation is we're going to hear a lot more songs about the people that musicians are talking to on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Just as we hear politicians talking about the people they talk to when they're out campaigning and grubbing for money. But the question I really want to ask is, is as you talk to people, is there, is there a clear technology breakthrough or is there some neat new feature of the internet that would really help the music community? We've got musicians in the audience, but we've got a lot of geeks in the audience, too. So is there anything that you've heard over and over again? You know, gee, I really wish we had this. <laughs> there is one. <laughs> <laughs> gee, I really wish we had a global repertoire database, yeah. um, which sounds so technical, but here's the reason. If you, if you think so? Yeah. yeah. So, so, um, so it, it hints at what's possible with the internet, that uh, my music could be played on a Greek radio station, or it could be played in a Chinese karaoke bar. It's all possible. The music, there's nothing stopping the music from getting there. It's how the money flows back to me and the songwriter that's a difficulty. And there are no um, sort of global databases that identify who the rights holders are. There are national ones. There's in the United States, there's ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, and in other countries, there's similar performance rights societies, that, and there's publishing companies that have their own databases. Then there's, um, but there's no database in the United States of all the sound recordings. Why? What? Why? Why? Because the national, Why? The national there was never a, there was never a legislated reason to have a database. The all the labels, it's kind of not proprietary, but it's their own catalog of stuff they own. And there was no body dis de deciding that there needed to be a meta catalog. But now, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it also put the national collecting societies out of business? No, it wouldn't. It would just be information and not, it wouldn't have the right to do anything with it. Did, but, did Harry Fox do that? Harry Fox has some of the information. There's a lot of really interesting stories about how difficult it is to verify what Harry Fox thinks it controls. <laughs> um, but this, comes up, this came up a lot with the development of some of the. Um, digital music services like Rhapsody that had to do direct licensing and um, how difficult it was, especially because they were one of the first movers in the space to do that, that direct licensing on a multiple, like, very, very complicated scale. Um, needless to say, there are more, there are efforts by a few different entities to try and build a global repertoire database. One of them is coming out of WIPO and one of them is coming more from a more kind of commercial space in um, England. And these conversations are happening um, there's the, na the thought of like, do we need one sort of unified, unique identifier that kind of travels with a, a piece of work. Um, so the, the, the bigger challenges are, you know, how do we break down institutional barriers? Who's going to fund it? Who will own the database? All these things. But assuming it could come together, it would really make it possible for me as a rights holder to get money when my music is played in a karaoke bar in China. That stuff's really difficult right now, but if that could happen, we might see a lot more money flowing back to the right people. Dick, do you have a digital magic bullet? Do you have um, well, I have, I have a, couple, a couple things I wanted to say. I was actually about while you were talking, um, Kristen, I was looking for, I was looking for a post from Seth. Sorry, I was looking for a post from Seth Godin that I saw the other day that I thought was really interesting. I wanted to go back to the first question, or the first uh, observation you made about uh, musicians in the future will only be extroverts. <laughs> which is, a, which is, I understand where you, where you get that from. And I guess the, um, what I wanted to say about that, I was just, again, I was just looking for 
for this particular post, but I'm going to try to paraphrase it. It basically said, essentially what it said is, if you try to please everybody, you please nobody. And not everybody is an extrovert. That doesn't mean that everybody does not have interests. If you truly do not have interests, and you're a musician, I'm not sure what planet you're from. You have got some interests. They may be really esoteric interests. It may be, you know, maybe you're interested in, you know, Mars land or, or you know, quantum physics, or I don't know what it is, but there are there are a thousand people out on the internet who are also interested in the same topics that you're interested in. Some of them may also be interested in music. And I think you have to be yourself. I don't think you should try to, I think you should try to fake out, pretend to be somebody that you're not when you're posting. That doesn't mean, on the other hand, that you shouldn't do it. It just means that you have to be, have to be real. Because what I've found in working hundreds and hundreds of musicians is that there's always somebody who's interested in what we have to say. Yeah, I've got three people the other night we went down to our local town to watch the piano, and I heard a clock in the back you know, saying, you think people will come over and talk to us? And it just reminded me that it's never changed. It's always been the same for, for man, to one here and another. When you're playing, somebody cares about it. you got to connect to that person directly. And you don't have to do it by somebody that you're not. Um, as far as a magic bullet, I think the, I'm not sure if this goes to your question or not, but we're in a real transition, transitory period in the sales world where I, we're going to end up of compulsory licensing, where different uh, uses for music are are obtained in the same way, not in practice, right now. It's via a, a, a you know a license that pays a particular rate, and I, I hope that the world continues to head that direction. Okay? As the cost of music goes down or at zero. That, in my opinion, is going to raise the cost of music back up to zero for amongst for musicians to make a sustainable living. And okay. the only other, yeah, I, yeah, I it's a part of that All right, well, we'll go. I think next then would be a tweet. Okay, I'll go to the person. Okay, or? Uh, you can go to the Hey, I'm uh, Bonner Morgan. Uh, I actually founded a uh, music technology startup called Vinylment that allows musicians to collaborate and create music together without having to be in the same approach. Um, some of these things that you guys are saying are really, really interesting to me, especially uh, looking at, like you said, the global repertoire for you know, that, uh, audio recordings. That's going to be huge. Um, I see a lot of things being developed on the distribution side. But on the collaboration side and the content creation side, what kinds of things do you guys see being developed in the future? Because as, as we become more and more socially connected across geographic locations, the need to collaborate using the web and using other platforms is going to be more and more important, probably even more important than distribution at that point. Because if I can distribute or post a video on Facebook, you know, I mean, from directly from a place that I'm creating the content, that may be even more valuable and more lucrative than actually just going through the platform by itself. So what kind of what kinds of advancements do you guys see in the collaboration side? And uh, uh, I'd just like to get your thoughts on what you see. Boy, I really couldn't hear very much of that. Yeah. That was a long question. Can you repeat it, please? It was um, primarily, and tell me if I get this incorrectly, it was about what kind of tools do you see coming down to increase artists' ability to create and collaborate together. Correct. Okay. Because we've seen, I mean, already, and it's been a, there's been a huge shift in, um, well, you're on your slide, you listed uh, five technologies that artists were, uh, that musicians were, thought was 
dramatically impacted them. And you also see people who can collaborate. You know, I think it was um, was it the postal service that they did their albums living in different city. They just emailed the sites back and forth. Um, so it's made the techno technology's made a huge impact. But as far as future things go, well, Dick might. Dick might run into this more because he works directly with artists, but I mean, in our survey and research and the interviews, people talked about it all the time, especially some session musicians um, who will, you know, get a gig and they're, you know, hey, can you play violin on this track? And it's, they don't have to go to the studio to do it. And since they're professionals, it can, you know, just go, go with it. They, you know, send them six different versions and, you know, they've, they've done it quite efficiently. So all that stuff is easy now, you know, that's, that's sort of the, tr the sort of very basic transactional style of, hey, can you, can you, can you, can you give me a, a violin track for this? The, with true collaboration where you're getting some people together, luckily there's web, the, the web versions like Google Hangouts and Stage It and stuff like this, like the ability for people to sort of multicast almost at a really cheap or low price or even free right now is almost, it's possible now. And it wasn't even possible like two years ago. So I think that multicasting and collaborating kind of face to face, -to -face through visuals might work in the future. I'm sure that stuff happens already. I just, I don't dabble in it myself, so I'm not really sure what's up with the technology, so. I, I wouldn't want to sound like a Luddite, um, but it, I, it, 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 Hearing this is, is interesting to me, having just finished a round of collective bargaining uh, within the last 12 months in which we talked a lot about um, the difference between really creative collaboration and, on the one hand and just exploitation on the other hand. Just more and more musicians go into the studio and they're really producing much, much more product in very much less time and they're being forced to do more doubles and to, to pack to pack more in um, and, and it, there, there comes a point you know talk about I hear musicians talking about you know um, lifting weights with their face I mean, you know, <laughs> because they're, they're doing so many things uh, uh, and, and yet still only being paid for just the one session so I, I'm, I'm all for creative collaboration but but I, you know, sort of draw a line between that and just the, you know, the exploitation where people are expecting much more product out of you and not willing to pay you for what they're getting. Well, and uh, I was going to ask Dick if you had, can you hear me, Dick? Did you have any suggestions yeah. or any things that you? Well, I, there are a couple of things I wanted to say. Num number one, well, I think what I wanted to talk about was um, was was remixing. That to me is just such a fascinating area, and it's an area that. Um, electronic musicians in particular, but increasingly non-electronic musicians, and not just in the you know rock and pop world, are really investigating. I think the combination of streaming music services, which effectively give you access to the world's shoebox or a good you know a substantial portion of it, combined with the ability to you know, talk directly to an artist to get them to, to so they can kind of immediately email you a stem and you can do a remix on it. That to me is fascinating. And I don't think that's I don't think that has been ordered, like I said, by rock and pop. I can't wait to see jazz musicians and uh, you know, I don't know, country musicians starting to remix um, works. And really and for that matter Electronic musicians remixing jazz. Uh, to me, to me, that's just that's such a wide open area. And it's so easy to, to do. You know, there are a wide variety of technologies, and Java Music is one that, that um, allows for you know very, very easy mixing <coughs> of, of uh, stems, and then whoops, sorry, my screen just went black. And then display of of those mixes, you know, as part of a contest on Facebook. Um, I just, I, that's, uh, that's a really remarkably wide open area and this artist that we're working with right now is probably getting five or six remixes of every song on her record from different bands. That's just totally fascinating. So uh, that's the part of it that I'm, that I'm particularly excited about. I, I think that's really cool. But as we're talking here about what's it going to 
mean to artists there's going to be disability and I just want to say and how are all the artists going to get paid including the artists whose works are being remixed um, yep. so there's a lot of you know there's a lot of great things but then there are legacy clearances and laws and things that have to catch up and and let let the work happen but let the creators get paid so, could that mean that new marketplaces will also emerge too? I mean, like, if, I'll just say, for instance, like, you live in a novel. Say, for instance, they create some kind of marketplace that allows them to sell their guitar works and things like that. I mean, those are, even though it, it may not be a Kanye West uh, drumbeat, you know, somebody, if they hear a nice guitar work, they may buy that for $5, but they can continue to share those things. But, so do you think like new marketplaces may fail or I think there already are those marketplaces. Kristen knows yep. more, but I think there already are those. I mean, kinds. you you probably have heard of these, but if there are places like Pump Audio, Rumblefish, uh, Getty Images Music that offer generic versions, pre pre cleared licensed versions of famous riffs, drum beats, samples, loops, all that stuff um, that's very affordable to purchase for your sort of underground, under track, you know, bass tracks and stuff like that. Um, and then there are artists who will uh, participate in the marketplace that sort of pre-clears their licenses for sync uses, but sometimes they stop at having their works re uh, use as samples. But you're right, the market is, it's, is responding to the licensing issues that are quite cumbersome in the existing models by trying to work around what the existing law says. Um, but it's not perfect either. There's certainly, uh, you know, important le le legislative background and history to, to recognize, you know, as part of this. Okay. Um, well, because I know we we're supposed to go to some place. Should we just keep going? Yeah. OK. Um, should I take a tweet next? And sure. OK. So uh, how valuable is bottom-up promotion, for example, fan videos on YouTube? And if valuable, should that be recognized in some form of limited licensing be formalized? OK, Dick, that one is for you. <laughs> can you repeat, can you repeat it, please? Um, how valuable is bottom-up promotion and marketing, like fans making videos of your songs? And if it is valuable, um, what there, should there be some kind of licensing arrangement? I just want to say the person, um, and I always say their name wrong, I guess it's Gatje, just put up a mix that he did of all of the YouTube fan videos of his song, and he mixed them all together, and then he gave them all credit and links to all of the fan videos that he mixed together on his. So it, it's somewhat happening even already. Um, okay, so I'm going to answer that question one second. I, 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 there was one point I wanted to make in relation to the last question about actually the last statement by you, Anne, where you said it's very important to get the payment right. I just want to remind everybody in the audience, not, not like I need to remind you maybe, but the, the, the entire history of digital recorded music goes back to about 1998. And realistically, it goes back to about 2004. So it's less than 10 years old. And by almost any estimation, that's a 1.0 product. And a 1.0 product, you have all seen software that comes out, the first version of software always has bugs. It's never exactly right. And, um, you know, I, to answer directly to your point, um, 
know, there is something in place. All these smartphones, we're going to be standing around building to that and then sharing on their Facebook pages, on their Twitters, their large friend follower accounts because all their friends are excited they have a great job with something all over there too. Um, and we, we, we work to help create that content so that you don't have to do all of the work yourself. And I think that more realistic companies need to do that. Instead of just asking for that. Can I add a, a technical thing to it? So, you know, you asked, uh, the Twitter person asked about whether there might be a licensing remedy for it, and there actually is one, which is fascinating and maybe not well known. It's called Audio Swap. And so if you have a user-generated video and you added a famous song that you didn't write um, and, you know, maybe some top 40 hit that you've heard that goes well with your kid's swimming video or something, um, and you upload it to YouTube, in the process of uploading, I don't know if you've ever encountered this, um, doing it yourself, but it'll ask you if the, hey, you know, we noticed that this is a licensed copy of, you know, of something something and um, then um, would you like to replace it with a licensed copy of it and it's called um, audio swap and it's something YouTube offers to uh, rights holders like record labels to say like hey if you you know license your catalog to us your repertoire we'll make sure that as user generated videos uploaded we replace it with a licensed copy and what it looks like on the user end is the YouTube video has a lower thirds kind of banner ads that the money goes to the rights holders and then it also has like you know this is the song title you can buy it here and there's little links at the bottom so they're sort of wrapping the user generated video with licensed um well ways ways to generate money off of it okay i think we're to a question here so yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Luke Montar Barney. I'm a grad student at Georgetown and also a musician and a DJ. Um, I wanted to know, I mean, I, this might be a kind of passe example, but maybe five years ago, when we talked about the future of music, we could look at what radio had to do and be really enamored with the kinds of things that they were doing, whether it be that they were selling um, their album at whatever cost you wanted to pay for it, or um, they were releasing, you know, bits and pieces of their songs for you to remix their song right here. So I was just wondering, um, the, the, we talked about remixing already, but maybe the first example of kind of, hey, what you feel like, um, how, you know, now that we've kind of zoomed out of it and seen how that whole process worked out, and now Louis C.K. is trying to do that with comedy and stuff like that, I was just wondering what the kind of critical response was to it and how that's going to affect it in the future. Granted that, Radiohead is plenty rich and can, and can definitely ask you to pay nothing for their album because they're at that stage. Still, I was just wondering what that market-based um, approach looked like to you. I have an answer for that one. So I loved, I loved the Radiohead model. I mean, I love the experiment, but there were some flaws in it. And I think um, Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails did a better version of it about six months afterwards. So his record, Ghosts 1 through 4, which was 2009, I think, um, instead of just paying what you wish, he actually um, allowed his fans, he gave them a lot of different options. Sort of, he had different price points. So $5 got you um, a download of the entire album or something. And then it went up and up and up and like there was a $750 or something. Signed, limited edition, books and CDs and all that stuff. So, um, and there were six or eight different options in between. So I think what he was trying to do was sort of maximize the, Recognize that his fan base might care about the five dollar CD or the free something something, or the seven hundred and fifty dollar box set. But he wanted to make sure he was meeting all of those needs, and he was also very public about the amount of money he made, and it was significant. I think one point six million or something in the first ten days. Um, now, of course, Trent Reznor, very famous. There's been other versions of interesting uh, um, experiments, mostly with Kickstarter and pre um, pre funding new releases, people like Amanda Palmer, and uh, especially Amanda Palmer, um, who have you know, generated a lot of money in advance of selling a record, but have a lot of incentives to offer their fans. So there's lots of stuff going on. You know, if you're back and you put out cheap music, which he just did, which is awesome, uh, you know, there, there's another experiment. We'll see how that goes, right? Okay, I'll fix that. So, so I, I agree with you, Kristen. There, you know, the, on Amanda Palmer, 
specifically. One of the reasons she's able to do what she's doing is because she's all in. I don't know how many of you are actually familiar with her, but she's uh, when she when she does something. I mean, for instance, for every thousand new fans, or no, excuse me, for every thousand new participants um, on her on her album funding. Album funding uh, quest. She did a sign wherever she was. As soon as she found out about it, she either wrote something on her body. She's a performance artist, so half the time she's you know writing on her body naked, or she's you know that, that's what she does. It's her thing. But she's she's all in on it, and her fans know that. And because they sense that she's all in, they're incredibly loyal to her. And she attracts new fans because they know that she's sort of, that she's not old lady back. And that's, in some ways, the definition of great art. I'm sure, I'm sure you know, that other musicians in the room would agree. When you, when you put it all out there, that's what people respond to. I wanted to, I wanted to read real quick. I, I finally found this, this Seth Godin note that I was looking for. And I think it's good food for the thought. It's kind of off the topic of what we were just talking about, but I just thought I'd read it real quick. It's not very long. It says, who decided to add the noise? Five or 10 years ago, did people start saying, I don't go to Yankees games anymore, the stadium isn't noisy enough, and there aren't enough ads on the big screen TV? The new arena in Newark is purpose designed to pump as much distortion-free sound into the seats as possible, and they're not afraid to use it at any opportunity. The noise slash music slash distraction is as much a marketing choice as your logo or the coupons you use. When the Harry clerk at the Delta counter starts yelling at the PA system, that's marketing as well. The calculation, if it gets made at all, is a complex one. How will this investment in speakers and amps translate into an increased audience or sausage sales? And this is the last point. When you turn the stadium into a real life video game, when the audience can't hear the players or the skates on the ice, you will no doubt attract an audience, but they will be the drive-by masses, not the lifetime fans. The choice to delight the masses at the expense of the diehards seems easy in the short run, but it's ultimately crippling to the future of the brand. That's a good thing to think about. Mm -hmm. And I think we can end on that because they're going to uh, make us leave now. And um, <laughs> I, we, we're over 15 minutes and I hear we have to be out. But, uh, and I feel really bad because we have another panelist who is on the train back from New York and apparently didn't make it. Um, <laughs> so thank you all so much for joining us and I hope you found it 